Okay, so our next speaker is Mahmoud Sharif from Carnegie Mellon University, and he's going to be talking about accessorize to a crime, real and stealthy attacks on state-of-the-art face recognition. And you can go slow because we have time. <laughs> so hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Um, I'm going to talk about real and stealthy attacks on state-of-the-art face recognition. This is joint work with Shruti, Luyo, and Mike. So machine learning is almost everywhere. We use it for cancer diagnosis, we use it to build cars that drive by themselves, and we use it to build biometric systems that we later use for surveillance and access control. If machine learning fails in any of those cases, or even worse, if attackers can cause machine learning to fail, this can lead to many adverse consequences. We could start giving the wrong treatments to cancer patients. Self-driving cars might start having accidents randomly, and criminals may be able to evade surveillance or get access to resources they shouldn't be getting access to. Today I'm going to focus on the last, and specifically I'm going to talk about how attackers can fool face recognition systems. So one thing that we humans are really good at is recognizing objects and images. If I ask you what do you see in those images, without any effort you'd be able to tell me that you see a lion, a race car, and traffic lights. With the recent development in the area of machine learning, and especially in the area of deep neural networks, we're able to create strong models that match humans' ability in, their, uh, in, matching, in recognizing objects. So for instance, if we ask this deep neural network proposed by Chatfield et al, what's in those images, it's going to tell us that it sees a lion, a race car, and traffic lights, and it's going to assign high probability to those glasses, meaning that it's confident in its decisions. Unfortunately, it was shown that deep neural networks are vulnerable to attacks. So if you look at those images that were modified slightly by an attacker, it's hard to see the difference between them and between the original images. At the same time, if I ask the same deep neural network what's in those images, it's going to make a mistake, and it's going to tell me that the lion is a pelican, that the race car is a speedboat, and that traffic lights are jeans. If you look at the difference between the pixels in the original image and in the adversarial image, it's hard to see that there is any difference. It's almost non-existent. In fact, we'll need to amplify each pixel in the difference by five times in order to see the actual modification that was applied to the image. As you can see, those modifications are very small. They are unstructured, and they cover the entire image. So it may be hard to implement them in practice or in physical reality. Differently from this work, in our work, we look at face recognition systems, and we ask the question of whether an attacker can change his look in the physical reality in order to impersonate some target. So for instance, we we're asking if I can change my look in reality, perhaps by ch wearing some accessory, in order to impersonate Carson Daly, a TV host in the United States. Uh, we're looking for attacks that have two new properties. The first one is physical realizability, where we want the attacker to change the physical state of the object that's being recognized, or his face. The attacker can only control his face or his look, and he can't control things that, or cannot control things that are usually not under his control. So for example, he cannot control the background. We also want those attacks to be robust against changes in the imaging conditions. So for instance, if the attacker stands a little bit further from the camera, or his pose changes a, little, changes a little bit, or the lighting conditions change, we want the attack to still work. The second property that we're asking for is inconspicuousness, meaning that we don't want the attacks to withdraw too much attention from the surrounding. To do that, we want to avoid using devices that emit light, or using excessive amount of makeup, or hiding the face entirely. For the purpose of this talk, we're assuming uh, our attacker will need to know how to change the input in order to um, influence the output in certain ways. To do that efficiently, we're assuming that the attacker knows everything about the system and its internals. So we're assuming that the attacker is operating under a white box setting. So before delving into the details of our work, please let me start by giving you some background on deep neural networks and early work on deceiving them. 
The idea behind deep neural networks is very simple. It's more or less like to simulate how the brain works. The basic building block is a neuron, which takes several inputs and computes linear combinations over this input, and then applies some simple function, maybe the logistic function, on this linear combination to generate an output. In this image, each circle is a neuron, and those neurons are sorted in a network where initially we have an input layer that, in the case of image classification, get the RGB values of the image. Then they pass their output to neurons in the hidden layer. And usually we have two or more hidden layers in the case of deep neural network as opposed to neural networks. And finally, we have the output layer where usually we have a probability distribution that's set over, over a set of predefined classes. So for example, in the case of face recognition, the input layer would receive the RGB values of a face image, and the output would be a probability distribution over a set of identities. Uh, what I want you to take from this, basically, is that deep neural networks can be seen as functions from inputs to, or images to probability distributions over a set of classes. The idea behind early work on deceiving deep neural networks was very simple. They basically asked the question, if I have a deep neural network and an input, and I want to fool the deep neural network, then what's this, the smallest change I need to apply to this input in order to um, cause the deep neural network to make a, mistake, a, a certain mistake, basically? This gives us the imperceptible adversarial examples that I showed in the previous um, slides. This was formalized as an optimization problem with two different goals. The first one was, was misclassification, where we wanted to find the modification or the perturbation R, such that if we add it to the image or to the input X, we'll minimize the distance between the deep, deep neural network's output, F in this uh, formula, from some target class CT. And the second goal of this optimization is to ensure the imperceptibility of the modification which is achieved by minimizing its magnitude. So for simplicity, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to refer to the first goal, the misclassification, as minimizing the distance between the function's output, the deep neural network's output on the modified image, x plus r, from target class CT. So this optimization can be solved via some kind of gradient descent process, like stochastic gradient descent or limited BFGS but you actually don't need to know this for the rest of this talk. So now I'm going to talk about um, face recognition systems and the attacks that we define for fooling them. So as I mentioned before, face recognition is used for, uh, in many applications. We use them for surveillance, for access control, and there are even some uh, schemes for cryptographic key generation from face images. The way that they usually work is that we have face detection and face rec recognition pipeline, where face detection finds the patch in an image where the face lies, and face recognition matches this patch to some identity. So for example, if we want to recognize the face of Andrew Carnegie, the founder of our, our university and at one point in time the richest person on earth, then what we'll do initially is we'll run face detection to detect the patch where Andrew Carnegie's face lies in the image. And then we'll run face recognition, which will assign a probability distribution over a set of classes. Here we have three classes, Brad Pitt, Andrew Carnegie, and Kevin Spacey. And the face recognition system made, made the correct classification by assigning the highest probability to Andrew Carnegie. We define two kinds of attacks on face recognition. The first one is impersonation where the attacker wants to change his look in order to be classified as some specific target. So this is useful for, for the attacker if he uh, wants to get access to the resources that only that target can get access to, or perhaps if he wants to have blame to be laid on that target. So for example, if Andrew Carnegie wants to break into the House of Cards filming location, he'd want to be misclassified as Kevin Spacey. The other attack that we define is dodging, where the attacker's only goal is to be classified incorrectly by the face recognition system. 
So this is useful if the attacker does not care about who he is being misclassified as, as long as he's being misclassified, or if he is seeking privacy. So for example, if Andrew Carnegie is ashamed by being Justin Bieber's fan, and he doesn't want to let people know that he goes to his concerts, maybe he, like being classified as any other person, would do. Today I'm going to focus on impersonation, but you can read more about dodging in the paper. We test our attacks on a deep neural network that was recently proposed. Uh, this deep neural network uh, was trained to recognize 2,622 subjects. And it was evaluated on labeled faces in the wild. So this is a challenging benchmark that contains more than 13,000 images um, that were collected in the wild, meaning that they were, they were collected in uncontrolled imaging conditions. So the collector did not control the distance or the scale of the faces in the image. He didn't control the pose. He didn't control the lighting conditions, etc. On this benchmark, uh, the deep neural network that we're using actually outperforms humans' uh, accuracy in classification. So whereas humans' accuracy or mean accuracy on this uh, benchmark is about 97.53%, the accuracy of the deep neural network that we're using has almost 99% accuracy. So now you can say that, well, we have a deep neural network that we want to fool, and we know how to fool them be using the optimization that I showed before, then why not use it? So by solving this optimization, we can achieve misclassification by minimizing the distance between the function's output on the modified image and the target class CT, and we ensure the imperceptibility of uh, this change by minimizing the magnitude. Under this setting, if Vicky McClure wants to impersonate Terence Tamsey, then she'll find an imperceptible perturbation that's so small, and if, it's, if she adds it to her image, or to her face image, she'll get misclassified as Terence Tamp. Actually, this modification is so small that we'll need to amplify each pixel in the modification by 10 times to see what's the actual change. So this is really great, but unfortunately, the attacker will need to modify the background in order to uh, succeed in this uh, misclassification or impersonation. And usually, the attacker does not really have control over the background. Our first attempt at the solution was basically perturbing only the pixels that cover the face. So we can do this by, well, first using image segmentation, finding and then find where the pixels that cover the face are, then changing or limiting the changes only to those pixels. Under the setting, if Vicky McClure wants to impersonate Terence Stamp, she'll use image segmentation, find the pixels that cover her face only, perturb only those pixels, and be able to impersonate Terence Stamp. A simple experiment shows that any attacker that we chose was able to impersonate any target that he was assigned to impersonate. Unfortunately, however, the changes that we need to apply are very small and unstructured, so it may be tricky to realize them. And even more importantly, the changes are so small that they are even smaller than a camera, a camera sampling error. So even if we manage to realize them, they may be undetected by the camera and the attack may not succeed. To solve this, we suggest to use fa facial accessories, and more specifically, eyeglasses. So eyeglasses would be easy to uh, realize because we can print them using maybe 3D printing technologies or 2D printing. Uh, and in fact, we use 2D printing in this work, as I'm going to explain later. And then it gives us some amount of inconspicuousness, because wearing eyeglasses is usually not associated with adversarial intent. People just wear them to improve their vision. Under the setting, if Vicky McClure wants to impersonate Terence Stamp, she'll find specific eyeglasses, such that if she wears them, she'll be misclassified as Terence Stamp. Similarly, Reese Witherspoon can impersonate Russell Crowe by generating her own set of eyeglasses to impersonate him. We tested how well this works in a digital environment. So we picked 20 random pairs of attackers and targets, and we measured how often the attacker can impersonate the target. We found that for 92% of the impersonation attempts, the attacker would succeed in this impersonation. 
So does this, this unfortunately does not mean that now we can print the eyeglasses, wear them, and impersonate, and start impersonating. There are still some obstacles that we need to solve in order to have this work. Now I'm gonna describe them. So our algorithm, if we don't uh, restrict it, it would generate edges everywhere in the eyeglasses that we're generating. However, we know that natural images um, consist of smooth patches that are separated by few edges. So for example, if we focus on this lion's nose, we'll see that almost all the pixels have uh, similar values, that their, their colors blend into each other. So we want our uh, eyeglasses that we're generating to have this property. To do so, we minimize what is called the total variations. What total variations measures is simply the distance between pixels in the same neighborhood or the same proximity. And by minimizing it, we force those pixels to be similar or to have close values. So Vicky McClure now is able to generate eyeglasses with smoother patches in order to impersonate turn stamp. The second problem is that our algorithm might generate colors that are not printable. So for every printer in the world, there's a set of colors that it cannot print. In fact, all printers cannot print complete black or complete white. To find what set of colors our printer can print, what we do is that we print a color palette that covers the entire RGB color space, and we print it to get a, set of a subset of colors that are printable. So it's hard to see on the screen, but please take my word for it that the printed color palette actually contains a subset of colors from the ideal color palette. And then we define what we call the non-printability score, which measures what's the distance of the colors on the eyeglasses that we're crea creating and the colors on the printed color palette. So if the, the non-printability score is high, it means that the colors are not printable. If it's low, it means that the colors are printable. What we do then is that we minimize the non-printability score as part of our optimization to ensure that the eyeglasses are printable. Finally, we want our attacks to be, or the eyeglasses that we're generating, to be robust. So two samples of the same face are almost never identical, which means that if we find eyeglasses that would get only one image misclassified, they might not get another image misclassified. However, we want our attacks to be robust against changes in the distance, in the pose, and then maybe uh, the attacker's changes in expressions. To do so, we collect of a set of images of the attacker, and then we find the modification that if applied not only to one image of the attacker, but rather to, to the set of images, it will have them misclassified. So we minimize the distance between the function's output and the target class, not only for one image, but rather for a set of images, which gives us more robustness. So if we put all the pieces together, our optimization have now has three objectives. The first one is misclassification, which is achieved by finding this modification that, has, that gets set of images misclassified. Secondly, we ensure that the eyeglasses that we're generating are smooth, which is done by minimizing total variations. And we ensure that the, the colors are printable, which we ensure by minimizing the non-printability score. So now you may be asking yourself whether this works in reality. To test that, we need three things. We need people to play the role of the attacker. So Louis, Shruti, and me uh, did that. We basically wore the eyeglasses and simulated the attacker. We wanted to realize the eyeglasses, uh, which we did by using uh, an Epson printer, a commodity Epson printer. We printed the eyeglasses on uh, glossy paper, cut them, or we printed actually, to be more accurate, the front plane of the eyeglasses on glossy paper. We cut them and we affix them to uh, frames of real eyeglasses. This is basically the result here. Uh, maybe hard to see. That, and that's me wearing them. And 
finally, since uh, Kevin Spacey and Brad Pitt were not available to help us with the experiments, we needed a deep neural network that can recognize the attackers. So before telling you about the experiments, I'll tell you about how we train this deep neural network. Training a deep neural network from scratch is uh, very expensive because you need millions of images, images that we don't have. Instead, we use uh, a standard technique that's called transfer learning that enables us to transfer the knowledge that is encoded in one deep neural network into another deep neural network that does a similar task. Using transfer learning, we train a deep neural network that recognizes 143 subjects, including the three, free, uh, the three authors and uh, additional 140 celebrities picked from the PubFig dataset. The accuracy of this deep neural network is 96.75%, which is close to humans and to um, state-of-the-art deep neural networks. Then, we tested how well those realized impersonations work. To do so, we followed the following procedure. First, we collected a set of images of the attackers to, uh, in order to solve the optimization that we, set, uh, that we uh, formalized. For each one of the attackers, we chose a random target and we solved the optimization to generate eyeglasses, then we printed them as I, ex as I explained before. Each attacker wore the eyeglasses and we collected 30 to 50 images of the attacker wearing the eyeglasses, and we classified those images using the deep neural network that we just trained. We measured how well the attacks work by measuring the fraction of images or the collected images of the attacker wearing the eyeglasses that got misclassified as the target. To make things easier on ourselves, we limited the lighting conditions. So we didn't vary them a lot. We found that real impersonations actually pose a real threat on state-of-the-art face recognition. So for example, Luya was assigned to impersonate John Malkovich, and in his case, 100% of the images that we collected for him wearing the eyeglasses got misclassified as John Malkovich. This doesn't always work with 100% success, Shruti was assigned to impersonate Colin Powell, and in her case, 16% of the images got misclassified as Colin Powell. I got assigned to impersonate Carson Daly, and in my case, 100% of the images got misclassified as Carson Daly. We did more experiments with additional deep neural network, and for that one, we showed that Luyo can impersonate Mila Jovovich with 88% success, and that Shruti can impersonate myself with 88% success. In the paper, we have additional extensions. So we show how an attacker can achieve dodging against state-of-the-art face recognition, as I mentioned before. We also show impersonations against a commercial face recognition system called Face++. Uh, basically, in those impersonations, the attacker uses an algorithm called particle swarm optimization to find eyeglasses that, if worn, will get him misclassified and he has only a limited amount of queries that he can query face++. So he's basically operating in a black box setting. Finally, we show invisibility attacks against the Viola Jones face detector, which is the most popular face detector out there. Um, the idea of invisibility attacks is a little bit different than impersonation and dodging. Basically, the attacker wants to find how to change his looks in order to, cause, in order to be invisible to the entire pipeline of detection and recognition. So basically, he wants to convince face detection that there is no patch in the image that contains a face. So to wrap up, uh, we show dodging and impersonation attacks that can mislead state-of-the-art face recognition. Those attacks can be inconspicuous to some extent, at least more than wearing a bag over someone head, someone's head and uh, physically realized. And we show extensions to black box models and invisibility attacks against face detection. Basically, our work motivates future research for making uh, more robust uh, systems for detection and recognition. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have lots of time for questions. If you have a question, please come up and state your name before you state your question, please. Hi, Ian, uh, University of Waterloo. Can you pop back to 20?